this session. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Animesh Mukherjee uh, from IIT Karakpur, and uh, he's uh, an expert uh, in uh, social computational science, and uh, he will uh, uh, tell us about um, the analysis uh, of uh, hate speech on social media. This energy, uh, um, Animesh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, can you share your screen? Okay, thank you. You can go ahead. Am I visible? Is my screen visible? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay. Thank you very much, Matteo, for uh, inviting me to this uh, workshop. And a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on your time zones. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our research on analysis of hate content in uh, social media. So. Uh, there is a small disclaimer that I uh, wish to give at the beginning. So this presentation might contain some offensive words, like, but however, this cannot be avoided given the nature of the work that we are doing. I have tried to suitably obfuscate them wherever possible. So let's begin. So I think like uh, social media needs no introduction these days. Like uh, uh, these days, whenever I go to talk uh, somewhere, I ask uh, young people like, uh, how many social media platforms are you member of? Rather than asking like, are you member of a social media platform or not? So it's defining our uh, social dimensions. Like, uh, and I uh, find like uh, some of the young uh, people have, uh, uh, social media accounts in more than uh, three uh, platforms. Uh, it, it's uh, interesting to understand like how they manage so many uh, accounts. And uh, actually, uh, uh, recently, social media has also become one of the primary sources of uh, news uh, consumption. So, uh, of course, although there are a lot of uh, positive things that uh, social media has brought with it, there are equally uh, large number of negative consequences. Uh, some of this polarization, abuse, and uh, hate speech, which is something that I'm going to talk a little bit about in this talk today. So uh, many of us are aware of uh, certain offline events, uh, quite unpleasant, that has happened in the uh, last uh, few years, like the Rohingya genocide, the Pittsburgh shooting, the Christchurch uh, shooting, the Bulanshar violence. And uh, many of these uh, seem to have been triggered from certain online events. So these offline real events, real life events seem to have an online trigger. So, uh, and this trigger can come from different social media platforms. It could be Twitter, it could be WhatsApp. This is a WhatsApp message that is uh, an uh, offensive and hateful uh, content expressed uh, toward the Muslim community uh, in India. And it could be also uh, some very new websites coming up like Gab, which I'll talk about a little more. Uh, in today's lecture. So uh, our efforts uh, in this uh, area can be broadly divided into studying the spread of hate speech, studying the temporal dynamics of hate speech, detecting hate speech, misogyny detection, and how to handle hate speech or counter hate speech. So uh, in today's talk, I'll be mostly concentrating on the first and the last topic. And this work is a joint uh, collaboration with uh, one of my colleagues here at IIT Kharagpur, uh, Professor Pavan Goel, 
and three PhD students, Bini Mathieu, Purnajay Shaha, and Mishun Das. So the first work that I'm going to talk about is about spread of hate speech in online social media. This was published last year in the ACM website. So uh, uh, I'll uh, introduce uh, you to a, a platform, to an upcoming social media platform, which is called Gab. And uh, this platform actually promotes itself as a champion of free speech. It has been uh, typically criticized as an echo chamber uh, for alt-right alt users. Uh, most of its features are like Twitter, but then with a much less moderation than Twitter. So uh, Gab says that it promotes uh, free speech, but in the disguise of that, it seems to promote a lot of hateful speech, which could have um, many ill repercussions. So uh, we curated a massive data set of around 21 million posts and 343,000 users uh, by crawling the Gab API. So uh, this uh, crawl actually contains uh, some basic information like mm, uh, the username, the posts done by the user, and the followers and the followings of a user. And you'll see what we do with this. So uh, the first thing, the first task in order to study you know, the spread of uh, uh, hate is to identify hateful users. So in order to do that, what we do is we create a seed set of hateful users, those who have posted some 10 plus hate posts. And then we create a repost network of users. And from there, we build a belief network. And then we initialize a seed set of hateful users and give them a score of one. And for the other users, we give them a score of zero. Then we run a very simple diffusion model and the final belief scores actually tell us whether a particular user is a hateful user or a non-hateful user. So if the belief score is between 0.75 and 1, we call the user to be hateful. Or 0 and 0.25, we call the user as non-hateful. So as you see, there is a large number of non-hateful users compared to a very small set of hateful users. So I will now detail out each of these steps in the next few slides for more clarity. So the seed set, how do we construct the seed set? What do we do is we actually create a, a high precision lexicon of 45 keywords. Now these lexicon contains like uh, various racial slurs uh, as you see here, some of them are written here. So we use these racial slurs in order to build this lexicon. And these are high precision because the presence of any one of or more of this slur on the Gap platform, which is like uh, reasonably an unmoderated platform, is almost surely indicative of hate content. So and we, uh, we try to call all those users who have 10 or more posts with one, of, one or more of these high precision keywords as hateful users. So from this, we construct a repost network. So what is a repost network? Let us assume that we have a small set of users, A, B, and C. Now, let us say, let us consider the node C. Now the node C posts 10 posts of its own that is denoted by this self loop here. And it reposts five posts from user A. Okay, so that is denoted by the directed edge. So in this way, user A posts 17 posts of its own, but does not repost anything from any of its neighbors. Whereas B does not repost anything, but only, sorry, does not post anything, but only repost nine of the posts of A. So now from this repost network, we construct something called a belief network. So again, let us consider the user C. So the user C, as you have seen, makes 10 posts. So it makes uh, 10 posts of its own and five posts from the user A, which, are, which we call the reposts. 
Now, therefore, the belief of user C on itself is defined as 10 by 10 plus 5. That is the total number of messages posted by C. So that is 0 0.67. Whereas the belief of C on A is equal to 5 by 10 plus 15, which is 0 0.33. So now you see that from the repost network, we construct a belief network with edges on the opposite direction. So this is how you construct a belief network from a repost network. Now on this, we run a very simple degrowth model. So, and say, let us say, through our head lexicon, we have annotated the user A as a hateful user because it has 10 or more hateful posts containing one or more of those hateful keywords. So now, once you run this diffusion algorithm for some time, it converges and each of these nodes actually get some scores. Now this score could be something between zero and one. If the score of the node is between 0 0.75 and one, we call that node to be a hateful user. And if the score is between 0 0.0 and 0 0.25, then we call the node to be non-hateful. So there is a big gap, which is like a confusion gap, and we do not want to wish to comment on them. So we only take cases which we are almost sure that they are either hateful or non-hateful. However, once we do this, we also do some addition. Hello, Animesh. We cannot hear you anymore. Um. Uh, once, okay, let me go back to the previous slide. So once we have got the score for every node and we have denoted the uh, nodes with score 0 0.75 to 1 as hateful users, KH represents known hateful and uh, the score with point, uh, 0 0.0 to 0 0.25 as non-hateful users. Uh, now we do some additional checks to understand whether whatever we have labeled are actually correct. So we ask two annotators to annotate 100 uh, such users, 50 from the hateful group and 50 from the non-hateful group. And we ask them whether they find that uh, the person that we have annotated as hateful is indeed hateful and the person that we have uh, annotated as non-hateful is indeed non-hateful. So we observe that the annotators have a high agreement with our model predictions, as well as the inter-annotator agreement is pretty acceptable. So the kappa being uh, somewhere between 0.7 to 0.87. So a few more checks. So we also try to see what are the different topics. So GAP provides topics under which you can post your messages. So we see what are the typical topics in which the hateful users post their messages and the topics in which the non-hateful users post their messages. You clearly see that the hateful users post their messages in certain uh, topics which are indicative of strong or intense uh, hateful um, content. Similarly, so to gather more evidences, we try to see what are the different URLs that the hateful users typically share in their post. And what you see that many of the URLs that uh, the hateful users share along with their post are extreme, represent extreme right URLs, con represent contents that are extreme right in nature, which is not true for the non-hateful users. So now with all these evidences, we know that whatever we have obtained from the degrowth model can be considered to be reliable annotations of hateful and non-hateful users. So once we have done this, we try to study cascades or we try to study the influence path. So a, a cascade is a path that is traced by a post as it is reposted by the different user. Now it is usually difficult 
to trace the exact path of influence. So we use a heuristic called the least recent influencer model to create a DAG to construct the trace of the path. So I'll again explain it through an example. So let us say that we have the same graph that we saw last time. So you have the users A, B, C, D, E, but now these ages that you see are the followership ages. If you remember in our data set, we also have the followership information. So this graph represents that C follows A, C follows B, B follows A and so on and so forth. And the number on the node indicates the time at which the node or the user has posted the message. So let us say A has posted the message at time zero, B at time 100, C at time 300, D at time 500 and E at time 400. Now the question is, I'm sorry. The question is that what do you assume C's, whom do you assume C's influencer to be? Is A the influencer of C? Has C seen the message from A or has C seen the message from B? A has posted at it at time zero and B has posted it at time 100. So C, since it follows both B and A, it might have observed the message from either A or B. Now, in order to uh, resolve this dichotomy, what we do is we use a least recent influencer model. So least recent means is the oldest person. So we assume that A is the person from whom C might have received the message. And uh, this is, we consider that A is the influencer of C. You can also assume something called the most recent influencer model where you will assume, where we will consider that B is the person from whom C has uh, received the message. So uh, we have taken both of the cases, the results doesn't differ much. So once we do this, and resolve this dichotomy from this graph, which has cycles, we now have a directed acyclic graph. So now once we have this directed acyclic graph, we know the exact influence path. So now once we have the exact influence paths, we construct the influence paths for all the hateful users that have been marked hateful by the degroot model and also by all the non-hateful users that are marked by the uh, degrowth model. Now, we study some very standard cascade properties like size, such as um, the, which indicates the number of unique users, depth, that is the length of the largest path in the cascade, average depth, that is the average uh, depth from the root node, the breadth, that is how, how um, uh, broad the cascade is at any level, and then the structural virality, which is like an average of the pairwise distances. Now, if you measure this property, these are very standard cascade properties that one can measure. If you measure these properties, we measure it on the original posts of the uh, KH and NH users, on the post containing media or images like uh, visual uh, and audio uh, or uh, image, okay? So multimodal content and post belonging to different topics. So what we observe is that for all the different uh, metrics, say size, depth, breadth, average depth, SV, the values of the KH users, that is the cascades of the KH users have a larger value compared to the NH users. That is the cascade of the hateful users are typically much larger than the NH users and all these are significantly, all these results are significant. Significant stays done through Kolmogorov-Smarnov test. And the uh, observations uh, point-wise are as follows. Posts of hateful users, as we have seen from the previous slide, uh, reach a larger audience, they spread wider, they spread deeper into the network, and they are typically more viral. And this difference gets more pronounced when you look at multimodal messages. So these posts that you saw in the previous slide, these are only text messages. When you include the multimodal messages, the differences get more pronounced. And so is the case 
when you study across different topics under which the uh, KH and the NH uh, caskets are built. So now the question is that, so we have seen that hate uh, content actually spreads pretty fast and pretty deep into the network. Now this could have many strong and intense as well as adverse consequences. The question is, can one think of designing platforms that could either or slow the spread of such hateful messages? Is there a way to do that? Is there a mechanism to do that? Now, some of the obvious things that one can think of is to say, block or suspend the hateful message or the account itself, the account of the user. You can block or suspend the account. Even actually several governments have established severe hate speech laws in order to prevent their spread. Many social media websites, including Facebook and Twitter, have come up with strict actions against hate speech. But now the problem with all of these very harsh and extreme steps could be that people might argue that this actually could curb the freedom of speech. It could violate the basic premise of freedom of speech. Then the question therefore immediately is, what could be an alternative solution? One of the most interesting alternative solution is probably countering hateful messages. That is, you have more hate speech, you have more speech to actually counter the hate speech. Okay, and counter speech is um, uh, being used by various different NGOs and actually Facebook has uh, uh, declared that counter speech is one of the most uh, going to be one of the most effective ways in future in order to stop the spread of hate speech. So uh, I'll quickly cover uh, the uh, next work. So here we try to study the effect of counter speech, uh, but now considering another social media platform, the YouTube. So and we consider in specific comments of YouTube videos, okay? And uh, for us, the definition of counter speech is as follows. It is a direct response or a comment that counters the hateful or harmful speech. So taking YouTube videos, uh, we actually study counter speech for three different uh, target communities, Jews, African-Americans, and the LGBT community. We prepare a large data set and do some first level analysis. The data set is available and uh, for further research. So we actually scraped comments from 31 hateful videos that are available on YouTube. So some of the examples are cited in this slide. So now there could be various different types of counter speech. It could be presenting of facts to correct misrepresentations or misperceptions, pointing out hypocrisy or contradictions, warning of online or offline consequences, showing affiliation, denouncing hateful or dangerous speech, humor and sarcasm, positive tone or hostile language. So we collect the data uh, using the following two step procedures. We scrape the YouTube, YouTube comments for the 31 videos. And then at the first level, we annotate these comments as whether it is counter speech or not. So roughly we have a total of 14,000 comments uh, and around 7,000 of them are counter speech and 7,000 other are non-counter speech. And the inter annotator agreement is around 0.8. In the second stage, we ask the annotators to classify further the counter speech into different types of counter speech. The different types are, as I have told earlier, like presenting of facts, pointing of hypocrisy, etc. Here, the inter annotator agreement is 0.87. So, after we did this uh, exercise, we observed the following distribution. So, one of the immediate observations is that most of the hate speech that comes on this uh, YouTube, that comes as this YouTube comments are countered by more hate speech. So there is a lot of 
hostile language that is being used to counter the hate speech of course this is this is another problem this is again a challenge that the uh, hate speech in itself is generating more hate speech as a countermeasure and we are presently looking into ways of stopping this but the good part of it is the other things that we uh, see in the table say for instance for the jews community we see messages that have a positive tone actually act very well in countering the hate speech against the jews community for the blacks community warning of online or offline consequences are the best measures to counter the hate speech for the lgbt community pointing out hypocrisy or contradictions or uh, expressing humor as a counter measure are the best ways seem to be the best ways of countering uh, hate speech against the lgbt communities these are all apart the hostile language so we also study some uh, uh, the very specific youtube metrics like the number of uh, likes that are gathered by different comments okay so what we observe is that for the african american community as i have already told that uh, consequences and denouncing of hateful uh, messages are the best ways of countering hateful uh, content for this community some examples are cited below similarly for the jewish community showing an affiliation that okay i am uh, a uh, muslim and i stand beside the jews so this is how you sh show your affiliation to a particular religion and then you subscribe the views of another religion so this is what is called affiliation so uh, we see that for the jews community such affiliation uh, based hate, uh, counter uh, speech works very well to fight the hate speech for the lgbt community as i already say that contradictions as well as humor are the best ways to fight uh, the uh, counter speech sorry uh, are the best counter speech to fight the hate speech so some examples are cited here so we also did a uh, classification a very standard of the shelf machine learning exercise where we tried to uh, identify what uh, given some training data um, the counter speech versus non counter speech we use some very standard bag of word uh, model to uh, identify what is or predict like whether a message is a counter speech or as an or a non counter speech uh, also we try to do the uh, second level classification that is if something is a counter speech then can we actually also classify them into one of the different types so the question could be like why do we need such a classification the basic need for such a classification would be if you want to automatically generate counter speech so as you understand it is a difficult exercise to have people or uh, ngo workers to actually type uh, and generate counter speech to like stop the spread of hateful message it would be very helpful if you could gener if you could have computers automatically or computationally generate counter speech so that is what is the aim but the first stage to do that would be to have an automatic uh, classification system like the one that we have developed so with this i would like to end my talk i think i am a little bit way of my time i'm sorry for that and all our uh, work can be found on this website and uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk thanks a lot yes thank you very much uh, animesh uh, that was uh, really very interesting we have a question in the q and a uh, could you give some idea about the typical uh, cluster size of the sentiment uh, driven avalanches that you mentioned in the beginning you, you can read the the question yourself in the q and a box i'm trying to read the question typical cluster size of the sentiment driven avalanches that you mentioned in the beginning not sure if we have uh, done a sentiment uh, 
analysis as such. Okay, could you give some idea about the typical cluster size uh, of the centrum driven avalanches that you mentioned in the beginning? So, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, what uh, is actually meant by the centrum driven avalanches. We have uh, uh, not identified uh, any cluster as such. Uh, uh, so I'm trying to guess. Okay, there is one more question. How do you measure the slowing down of uh, hate speech cascade? Okay, this is a very nice question. So uh, there is a question that how do you measure the slowing down of the hate speech cascade. So what we will, we will have to do, so in a more recent type uh, study, we have tried to study this cascade over time. So whatever I showed you is a single snapshot um, analysis of the cascade. Now, if you keep measuring these cascades over time, the, um, the uh, different metrics that I talked about, like the size, the uh, average depth, the depth and things like that, these will change. And if over time, the values of these actually fall, seem to decline, then you have a way to understand that the hate speech, hate speech that the spread of hate speech is slowing down. Does that answer your question? Yes, so, I think so. I had a, another uh, related question. So how do you measure the effectiveness of counter speech? So in other words, uh, uh, what is the, I mean, if uh, the counter speech messages uh, were or posts were not being uh, um, submitted, uh, would uh, the, I mean, the, the hateful uh, post uh, be, uh, have gone on uh, for long or no? I mean, do you have a measure of this? Yeah. That, that, that's again a very good question. So uh, uh, we did not measure it. Uh, I, I'll come to the measurement part a little later, but we looked into our data and we saw that there are a few instances where the original hateful uh, speaker actually have agreed to the person uh, on the counter speech and have actually expressed uh, apologies. So this has happened. So uh, there is not a direct way unless you do a argument analysis. So you have to somehow uh, do some sort of an argument mining and identify whether the chain of replies have stopped or whether the chain of replies do not include hateful messages any further. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are running a little bit late. So I'd like to introduce uh, 